Yeah. So those of you who are joining for the first time uh, on this uh, event, I uh, just want to give you a quick intro about Archimedes. Uh, Archimedes is essentially a code as a service platform that's backed by a community of developers, uh, designers, and product force uh, that are spread across the globe. Uh, we essentially help companies, mainly startups, and scale up to their product development needs. Uh, we help companies with prototyping, we build beta products, uh, and also develop enhancements for their existing products, uh, along with solving you know, complex engineering problems to help them scale. Uh, we'll be happy to chat more about our committees and what we do offline in case uh, you want to discuss this further. I don't want to take too much time from this particular talk. Uh, and also as part of our endeavor to build a strong uh, engineering community and share our knowledge and experience. Uh, we recently started the engineering mastermind series uh, where we bring in speakers who are you know, world-class engineering practitioners who have solved or solved complex uh, you know, challenges across a variety of industries. Uh, so this series is set to be a recurring monthly event brought to you by Archimedes. We did, that, we did our first event in December last year and this is our second event. Uh, and for the second edition uh, of the Mastermind series, I'm happy to introduce John Herkey uh, from Tiger Graph, who will be presenting on high performance graph databases and its use cases. Uh, so John uh, is a manager of developer relations at Tiger Graph, uh, which is one of Archimedes' partner companies. Uh, Tiger Graph is one of uh, the world's best high performance graph TV companies. In fact, I think they were listed by Forrester Wave uh, last year, end of last year as a leader in the category. Uh, so John will dig into what makes high performance graph TVs and also you know, highlight some of its interesting use cases. Uh, we've personally known John for I think more than a year now uh, and interacted with him on various occasions. Uh, he's incredibly passionate about his work uh, and brings a lot of enthusiasm to his role as a community manager and as a mentor to young developers. Uh, he's also the founder of Futurist Academy uh, it's a nonprofit that's dedicated to empowering the youth to become future STEM leaders. Uh, so thanks, John, uh, for you know taking the time to you know give us this talk. Uh, so without further delay, uh, you know I'll hand it over to you. Really appreciate you taking your time to do this. Perfect. Uh, do you just want to go mute on Clubhouse? All right, let's try this out. So <laughs> I'm going to share. Oop, hit the wrong button. Sharing my screen now. Okay, so yeah, <clears throat> thank you for being here. We're across uh, across the world. We're across platforms. We're we're in Clubhouse. We're in YouTube. We're <laughs> we're on Zoom. We're we're. I have my mobile phone in front of me. I have my computers up here. Uh, we have we have. You know all this recording stuff, and so thank you for for being here today. Um, I just thank you for that that generous uh, intro. I'll just give you a little bit more technical background about myself. Um, started off my career as a networking engineer in the military. So I go out in the middle of nowhere, shoot up to a satellite, grab an uplink, deploy a network, program routers and switches. Uh, went to work for a big company called United Health Group as a networking engineer. Got really bored really fast. Ended up being coming an entrepreneur in re uh, in residence, and so that's essentially a startup incubator inside of a big company. So I was building uh, startups uh, and then eventually uh, our, our group actually broke off and created a, a group called the Advanced Technology Collaborative that was solely focused on applying emerging technologies in the healthcare space. So if we think about emerging technologies, we might be thinking, um, you know, back back in 2000s, maybe you know, the internet, what is it? Why do we care? What's this thing as a web page? Do I need it as a business? Maybe I don't. I don't understand it. Um, the web page is a fad. And so, of course, it's not those technologies out right now, but uh, the technologies that are on the cusp of um, people understanding really what they are, are things like blockchain technologies. What is a blockchain? What is graph? What is AI? What's natural language processing, machine learning, deep learning, internet of things? Um, how does that affect us? Where should we look at uh, applying our, our business um, in that space? And so I come from the healthcare space. We're gonna go and dive in a little bit into some healthcare use cases based off my background, but we're also gonna go through some other use cases as well. So let me see if I can get this going. A little bit about TigerGraph. Uh, TigerGraph uh, provides uh, advanced analytics and machine learning on connected data. So what they are essentially is a scalable solution. And so you have this scalable graph 
uh, solution that is um, across multiple platforms. So we have um, Google, Microsoft, Azure, um, you have AWS, you can go on any of these, but it's designed to be scalable from the ground up. So a lot of the graph solutions, when they first came out, um, they're really meant for small use cases and they weren't designed to be scaled, uh, scaled horizontally. And we'll talk a little bit about, more about that. Um, so we have a large, large companies that are uh, using Tiger Graph in the back end, and we were founded in 2012, but we came out of stealth mode in 2017. A little bit about uh, Tiger Graph. Uh, essentially, it's a distributed graph database that connects data sets together. And it's it's not just these little th graph database solutions where it's a couple gigabytes. We're, we're growing into terabytes and petabytes. And so how do you how do you have a graph solution that interconnects all your data at that scale? And that's what we're really trying to solve. And so you can see some of our customers here on the left. Um, you could see some of the customers on the right as well for using the uh, analyzation of the advanced analytics. So what you're trying to do is use your connected data and analyze your data in real time. Um, and then you also are doing things such as uh, machine learning in the database with the connected data. And we'll go through a little bit of each of these things um, and in more depth here as we get going. Uh, a little bit about Tiger Graph. Uh, you know, we're, we're built to to go really deep when you're when you're thinking about multi joins and and across relational database uh, sometimes you'll you'll struggle if you start to go you know five joins 10 joins 24 joins <laughs> it gets it gets a little a little bit cumbersome and you can't have real time data data analytics um, with with having great graph databases and we'll go into this a little bit more um, that's not a, really a concern we we can go five hops 10 hops you can go as many hops as you want and their, uh, our performance of our graph solution versus some other graph solutions, there aren't too many out there that can actually go multi-hops super deep. Um, and once you get past five and 10, most other graph solutions fail. Uh, I already talked about us scaling horizontally. That's something that's a differentiator in the market. Uh, we're, we're also not only scaling horizontally, but we're also parallel processing, processing across all the different machines. Um, if you think about relational databases, one thing that's important is you want ACID compliance. We're ACID compliance. Our, our GSQL language itself is turning complete, meaning you can really do anything you want. Any, and any algorithm that you can dream of, you can, you can write it inside of Tiger Graph. And for those that uh, are, are not developers, there's also this no code solution. So if you're, if you're sort of just dipping your toes in and trying to understand Graph but still want the power of Graph, you can actually do that with no code. <clears throat> so let's get started. Um, if I told you that you're already using graph databases multiple times throughout the day, uh, many of you would be like, uh, where, where, <laughs> where is that? But it's, it's true. Um, in 2012, Google came out with things, not strings. They, de they declared in a blog that essentially everything in the back end that they're doing is interconnected data. And so what they're doing is connecting that data together. And as you're looking for a website, um, that's actually being queried through a graph database. And you might have heard of an algorithm called PageRank, which uh, was named after Larry Page. And that is the algorithm that they use to derive what, what links that they should be showing you. So you're actually using it uh, every day. Uh, you might not be knowing it. And we're gonna dive into some more deeper use cases. So what I wanna cover are what are graph databases? So why are you using graph databases and where are graph databases being used? If, if we can go over this, and you can have a general understanding of what is that, why, and where. Um, I think we accomplished our mission today. So, what are graph databases? This is a screen um, for those of you on Clubhouse. Uh, I do apologize because you, there's a lot of visualizations. But uh, if you think about relational databases, you have these tables. Um, there's, if you think of Excel, you have tables and rows. Um, it's a very rigid screen, uh, schema, but it's very high performance in transactions. There's other things like key value, which adds a lot of, uh, you know, high fluid schema, so you can have really dynamic data and uh, have high performance. But what thing that doesn't offer is that deep analytics, and we'll go into a little bit more why that's important later on. And then finally, we have graph databases. Now, there's a bunch of different types of graph graph databases. We're going to talk about label property graphs because that's what Tiger Graph uses. There's other graph databases called RDFs. Somebody have a question? Okay, they're they're updating Clubhouse here. Uh, 
All right, thank you. All right, thank you. <clears throat> so we look a little bit about, uh, you know, relational database or relational row store. So that's an atomic storage unit, which is in a row. Uh, we have columns within that. It's a very fixed uh, design. And uh, when we do uh, joins, they're, they're being done at query time. And so we're joining all the different tables. Uh, in the right-hand side, we have the atomic units are actually stored as nodes and edges. Um, we have nodes that have attributes. So you have attributes within the different elements and not only nodes, but also the edges. The relationships are stored in memory pointers. So <clears throat> what you can do from that is you can calculate stuff in real time. Uh, you're accessing the memory and it's really fast. Uh, when I say fast, it's a, about a thousand times faster than a join. Uh, so when you're, when you're putting data into, into your graph solution, all the data itself is actually joined as it goes in. So it's, it's, it's linking it as it goes in and it's stored in these memory pointers. Um, and that's what makes it incredibly fast. So if we think about label property graphs on the left-hand side, you can see sort of a schema. So you have different things. And this is what, uh, if you're familiar with uh, relational data databases, you also have schemas. So we have a schema and these uh, nodes actually have relationships to other nodes. And so on the right hand side, what you can see is that we have an order node and that order node has um, attributes. And so it, it could have an ID, it could have the quantity, it could have whatever you'd want to include as an attribute for that specific nodes. And you might also hear me say vertices, nodes, vertices. Uh, if I say one or the other, they're actually the same thing. The other thing is that you can see that we actually have a attribute on the edge. And so we're storing the date attribute um, on the edge. And that's pretty um, important when you have multiple, you know, multiple different things that you're processing. And you're looking at certain dates at certain times. There's other things you can do with dates and times uh, with trees. And that's just a, a different modeling techniques that you might want to use. But this, I just wanted to show that you can actually store uh, these data elements on, on the edge as well. So why use graphs? You know, why, 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 why should I even look at graphs? I mean, uh, graphs not a, a solution for everything, but if you have a lot of complexity in your data and you have data across all these different systems and you need, and you need to access different things at the same time, um, and, and traditionally there might be some uh, modeling penalties for being able to hook all of those things together. Um, in graphs, there's no penalty for, for modeling complexity. You can have all the different things. On the left-hand side, this is an actual graph that I worked on. Uh, this is the healthcare graph, and we'll dive a little bit deeper into that. The other thing, if you're struggling from death from joins, uh, if you are doing more than five joins, 10 joins, 20 joins, let's hope you're not doing 20 joins, but if you are doing 20 joins, uh, you might want to look at a graph solution. If you're trying to understand your data and you have to go deep links. And when I mean deep links, maybe you're doing multiple hops over, you're going through multiple systems. And so one thing you could think about is maybe a, a, a bank and you have, uh, you know, financial, financial things here and a transactions over here and financial things here and transaction over here. And you're, and you want to look through all these different things and maybe go to all the different loops that this, this, maybe this fraud person is looking at transacting over here and then going into this other system transact, but then eventually the money goes back into this, this, this person's account, um, to be able to, to go through all those hops and try to analyze things in a, in a deep link analysis. It's, it's very hard in a traditional, in a traditional solution. If you're looking at doing real-time aggregation, um, and so let's say you have tons and tons and tons of users and you want to pull up all the information about a user in real time, um, good luck on doing that on a traditional, uh, traditional relational database. If you need flexibility for design, if you need to be able to add new data elements to your solution, uh, without having to uh, recreate your whole schema and have to remodel and drop all this stuff, uh, graph is very, very uh, forgiving in the sense that you can add, oh, I forgot this node. Okay, well, let's just add that node and then add the relationship. You don't have to bring down the database, you know, re-architect the whole thing. You're just appending essentially the new uh, node or vertice into your solution. 
Also enhance machine learning. If you're using machine learning uh, in your current solution and want to look at to do enhanced machine learning at looking at the relationships, and we'll dive a little bit deeper into that as well throughout this presentation, you might want to look at graph databases. So what, what are companies using it for? I'm not going to go through this list extens extensively, but there's uh, companies, and you might know them, uh, wish.com if you're doing transactional stuff and looking for recommendations for different products. Uh, if you're HBO, how do we get people back to, uh, from Game of Thrones? Uh, if you're looking at doing, um, you know, sometimes it's mixed. You can see there's mixed, which is transaction deep link analysis prediction. We'll go through a couple of different mixed work workloads. If you use TurboTax into it, uh, you're probably using TegraGraph and Graph under under the back end. So you probably don't know that you're using these graph solutions in the, in the back end, but um, you're using them every day. So what, what I wanted to go through this uh, because I think it's a good exercise uh, and, and this goes a little bit from the use case that I've been working on back in my days at UHG and Optum is we have a lot of highly complex data across multiple systems. So if we think about a patient and a patient has a claim and a prescriber and a facility that they, that's linked to, to the, the doctors, and then we have medical records and claims, and not only claims from one system, but from a dental, which is a whole nother business. And then we have uh, uh, claims from this other system and claims for prescription. And we have all of this data. And what if we wanted to have all that data with our 50 million patients and retrieve that data as fast as you were just clicking on LinkedIn, right? You're just going to LinkedIn, all your stuff shows up. How do we make that happen? Well, it's, it's not gonna be possible with traditional databases. So what we wanna do is look at how we would model that in complexity. So on the left-hand side, uh, we have the sort of, this is a mock, uh, a mock a solution. And what we would want to do is then model this solution with a patient and a patient has prescriptions. As we showed before, you have these, these nodes that have connections. So every time that there is a patient that has a new touch point, um, let's say they, they got a prescription and they got another prescription, maybe they, they got diagnosed with an allergy, you can see that there's a start date, maybe their allergy goes away, I don't know. Um, and then let's say they have a couple different claims. To get all of that data, because it's interconnected modeled, all we're doing is doing a one hop. We're just doing a one hop to go grab that data. And that's in milliseconds. We can grab all that data across all the different systems that are feeding and streaming. Um, you're, you're maybe doing batch uploads. You're maybe doing streaming through Kafka. Maybe you have some kind of system set up um, and, it's, and it's all going into your graph solution. You can, you can do things that you were not able to do before. And that unlocks tremendous business value. And so this is a 360 dashboard that uh, is being used by uh, one of the lines of businesses. And what they're trying to do is have all those touch points. So as a, as a person calls in, maybe how do, we, how do we best serve them? Were they contacted? When, when was their last claim? Um, when was the last uh, time they did a visit? Maybe we should put some notifications on there because they, you know, the, the medication that they're taking um, uh, it was determined that maybe they shouldn't be taking it anymore, be a stuff X, Y, and Z. Um, and so before this, you were not able to actually pull all that data together, 50 million patients and all of their data points retrieved faster than a Google search. So if you think of a Google search, that's 200 milliseconds. This is retrieved in 50 milliseconds. Now <laughs> imagine how much, uh, how much business value that unlocks to have that data accessible in real time and right there for the, the end users. Excuse me, I'm gonna take some water. And not only, not only is it unlocking things, but it also helps you enrich your data. And so having your data in here, it, you can do things with the patterns and you can understand rules. Uh, and those rules then relate to new relationships. So I'm gonna cover the one on the right-hand side first um, so the, the right-hand side is a person. The person has a claim. That claim is then um, the orange node is actually a, I think it's provider or maybe it's a person, but a person, claim, and then a provider. And you see person, claim, and provider. And there is no data around who referred who, but using a graph and looking at patterns and understanding how that pattern works, you can then put in referrals or other connections between data, the data elements based off 
uh, your existing data. So you can actually use data to enrich data. You can use algorithms to enrich your data. So on the left-hand side, we're looking at um, a person, we're looking at some claims and patients, and then what we might be doing is looking at doing some an analytics and then determining or categorizing these people based off certain certain things, maybe where they live at, maybe maybe based off their claims, maybe based off, it uh, looks like they have drug rehabilitation center. Um, so maybe maybe they're, they're, they're doing some analytics and trying to determine sort of, sort of high risk patients. So you can use your data to then derive new data. Um, and another element I wanted to add too is you can use machine learning to enrich your data. So uh, if we went back to the original slide where we had this big, huge medical graph, um, we had some uh, one of those nodes that was nurses notes. And so you have maybe a system that has nurses notes or maybe have medical, uh, you know, medical documentation or benefits or things like that. And what you want to do is go through your data and you want to enrich in it. Um, and what you're going to do is run machine learning. So you're doing natural language processing. You're doing entity extraction. You're interlinking that and you're putting it together and then you're running algorithms. Now, I just want to relate this, that this is exactly what Google did. So if you were around and TigerGraph was around back when Google was out, you could, you could have built Google back on TigerGraph. Um, so essentially in, in, in Google's case, they have websites, they're going through it, they're crawling it, they're pulling entities together. They're, they're then putting it into a semantically linked uh, network and then they're running page rank to determine what this should actually show you. So where are graph databases being used? I, I, I'm going through a very visual uh, exercise because I think it's the best way to understand graphs. And uh, I could, you know, I could put a bunch of words on there, but we're gonna just look at more at the visuals. And so let's look at customer 360. Now, the reason I put customer 360 and recommendation engine in, in here and then pointed it to LinkedIn um, is because essentially that's the same thing. You have a person, you know, in the previous one, we had a patient, right? And in this one, we have a person. And so this person has a bunch of, bunch of information that they're dishing up at that person at the at runtime. You don't have to wait, you know, minutes to, to see this. Uh, you're, you're actually seeing the 360 of yourself in real time. Um, and so under the hood is actually a graph database. And so this might, you might be like, well, this is a little like a lot of nodes, but what they're doing is using analytics to, to break that down. And they're doing that with the feeds and we'll go into that a little bit deeper. But essentially, if you think about LinkedIn, it is a 360 platform all centered around you. Um, what Tiger Graph allows you to do is you could be the next LinkedIn, you could be the next Google, you could be the next whatever you wanna be, these big, huge tech companies had their own custom graph solutions um, and they pre-built those. Now we democratized graph databases and allows, allow anyone to have the same power that the big companies have. So let's break this down. We have uh, LinkedIn. So if I'm thinking about this and let's say I'm just like prototyping, I'm gonna create my own LinkedIn in the future. Maybe I have some mock-ups and I'm trying to think through how I wanna design my thing. Um, let's go look, look at what we would do. So we have a person, we're gonna have a person. Person might have some uh, characteristics about them. Maybe they have their first name, their ID. Um, you, the next thing that we might wanna look at is a, a person's located in a city. So we have a city node um, and we also have a located in city. We also have a city is related to a state and a state is related to a country. Um, so this on the right hand side, this is known in the graph world as a geo tree. The other thing is a time tree. So if you have highly, um, you know, you have, a, you have a lot of data that's related to time, you might want to look into doing time trees. Um, and what's what makes this unique is that let's say I want to look at all the people within, um, you know, a certain a certain area. So let's say I as Google or as uh, we're on LinkedIn. Let's say I want to, to sort and filter based off uh, a location of a city. Instead of going in a relational database, going through and looking at the different things and doing, join this up, all we have to do is start at the city and then follow the edge to the person. Those are all the people that live in that city. So you're, you're really narrowing down where you're gonna be searching, which increases the speed of what you're going to provide the user. The other thing is that we might have some organizations. Uh, so this person works for an organiza organization. The organization might be located in a certain city. Uh, let's go down a little bit more. So we have, uh, <laughs> here we go, Sadiq. 
they, they got a post from him. He just created a post. Um, also, I just liked that post for some reason um, because it's maybe talking about this talk. We also have some tags. So we have tags, has tags. Uh, this post has tags. And the post also mentioned uh, in this post, uh, Tiger Graph. And so you could start to see as we're deconstructing the LinkedIn platform on the left, how that relates into a graph. And we don't want to forget this, but a person also follows a person, a person is connected. So I'm following Sadiq and um, you know, that means that certain content might be showing up on my platform as well. So just going through a couple, couple last ones of LinkedIn before we keep moving on. So we have groups and we have an events. So you can easily see all of these different things as they start to accumulate how they all, how they all work together and how they finally come into a graph, uh, a graph solution. And so on the right hand side, you would call this a graph craft schema and how you create your schema is very much trying to understand what you're trying to derive and what questions you want might ask. So um, that's, that's what it looks like on the right hand side. So what does this allow us to do? Um, we can do things with uh, sorting data. Maybe we want to understand, uh, you know, what should I determine, or as LinkedIn, what should I provide the user um, to see? And on the right-hand side, you can see things like Arun Bachu finds this insightful. Um, I'm connected with David. Uh, they're, they're probably doing some kind of algorithms in the background. So in the middle of this list, you can see all the different types of algorithms. You have path algorithms, centrality algorithms, community algorithms, similarity algorithms, Jakar, cosine. And throughout numerous uh, projects, they'll actually be using some of these, these algorithms in the back end. And, um, and you're doing this in real time. And so all of these algorithms are written in GSQL for, for Tiger Graph, which as I said, was a turning complete. So literally can represent any algorithm that you want, any logic that you'd want. And you could derive that and use that to, to populate your feed. And on the left-hand side, we have, uh, you've probably seen this where you go into people and you could do first connection, second connection, third connection. I just wanted to illustrate what that looks like in a graph. So we have John, John's connected to Sam, Fred and Jill. Um, then we might want to go down another level and you could see John is connected to Dan and Beth through, through Sam, Fred and Jill. And then we could see the third, third relationship. So if you didn't know what the first, second and third meant when you're looking at your, uh, you know, managing people and you're looking at who's connected to who, uh, this is what it looks like at, in the, in the back end. So you could see the orange elements in the far right are actually my third degree of connection. So let's look at some more. So hopefully that gave you some basic understanding of breaking down a actual, an actual application. So you know, it's not we're not just doing a fake application. We're just deconstructing an actual application and showing how it was modeled. Um, let's get into a couple of different other use cases. If you use Netflix, we talked we talked about HBO. Hey Netflix, if you want to uh, join the Tiger Graph train over here, you can come over here and uh, you know jump in. But um, what they're doing is they're doing recommendation engines. So if you look at um, over here on the right, we have uh, the 99% match. That's using uh, similarity algorithms. And what they're doing is they're looking at a individual. So we have Alex likes the let's see, the Don Wall and a quiet place and we have Kevin likes the, the quiet place and, and searching. And what they're gonna do is they're using this algorithm to determine, okay, this, this person is, is similar to that person. This person liked this, this, and this, and that other person liked this, this, and this, and then that, okay, well, maybe we should recommend that to this other person that's really similar to Alex, right? Um, they, they're the, sort of the same people. They watch the same movies. They're in the same genre. Um, and, the, and, you know, let's say Kevin didn't see that movie yet. Well, maybe we should recommend that movie to Kevin. Now that's not only in Netflix. Uh, everyone's used Amazon before. You've, you've probably scrolled down on a product and you see this um, customers also bought. So we're, they're recommending different products. Um, so you'll see, you'll see different products that are being recommended based off, oh, this user bought this, 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 and this other user bought this, 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 and that. Well, maybe you should recommend that to that user because they're pretty similar users. And you know, we're, we're assuming there's gonna be like a 95% chance that, that if we recommend this product, that they'll buy it. 
And so you, if you've used Amazon, you're using some graphs. If you used, we talked about Google. Um, so, you know, Google came out with PageRank uh, back in 2000. They might have came out with the PageRank actually before 2012, before they declared that they're using graphs in the backends. But again, on the right hand side, what do we recommend uh, the user to, you know, people also search for? We have, we'll recommend some books because they're connected to a George Washington. We'll give a little snippet about George Washington. We'll recommend this ad. Um, so if you think about, okay, this user is similar to that user and that user clicked on this ad, maybe we should recommend that ad to this user. Um, so if, you're, if you start to think in graphs, you can start to see all the different ways that they're being used for recommendation engines. Now, they're not only in recommendation engines, so we have all of these different use cases. I don't think we're going to touch upon every single one, um, but we can go deeper into each one after the after this session. Um, of course, our website also has uh, this exact same link. So if you go on to our website, uh, you can go into solutions and you can just do a deep dive in, into in the, in any of these individual ones as well. So we have energy management. So this is a different uh, sort of a unique use case. And when the first time I heard about it, I was like, oh, that's genius. Uh, so we have, these, we have these energy management companies that are looking for real-time uh, analytics around their, their networking energy distribution. So Essentially, let's say let's say we have an energy shortage, or we need to, or something goes down. How do we reroute the power? What what is our primary? Maybe there's a government center. Uh, we need to reroute power to this facility because of the higher priority. So in real time, what they're doing is analyzing the network and recalculating, recalibrating, and reshifting power resources in real time uh, across their energy grid system. And so you can you can use things. Uh, because you can do these calculations in real time on, on the graph database, uh, you can do things like this as well. Not only, not only are they being used in NG grid systems, uh, if you, if you uh, have a Land Rover or Jaguar car, uh, this is actually from Land, Jaguar Land Rover. Um, so they're trying to figure out, okay, so we have these suppliers, we have parts, we have features, we have cars. What happens if a supplier goes down? What happens if a part goes bad? What happens if a, um, a new feature, what happens if demand goes up for this car? Do we have the parts and suppliers to back that up? What happens if the demand goes down? Can we reuse the parts in certain ways? And so they're recalibrating essentially their, uh, their uh, supply chain in real time. And so something that usually took, took them, I think three weeks, uh, they could do in a matter of you know, minutes. Um, they're recalibrating all these different things and trying to reroute, okay, well, this car's really popular now. It's using the same sunroof as this other car. Um, let's, let's, you know, it's more profitable if we move this and that and this and that it helps them retweak their supply chain in real time. Hey, John, just quickly, do you, does it make sense to see uh, what, like, because you have all the use cases on the left, um, just pull the audience very quickly to see if they're interested in a particular use case, maybe? Um, yeah. To go into further, um, I, I personally would pick what you pick, which is fraud detection, but would love to get a sense of what folks maybe want us to go into a little bit more. Yeah, and these next slides are all in fraud. So if you want fraud, we're going to go deeper. Anybody have opinions and want to go into specific use cases? Um, so I'll, also, I'll suggest one, this is, uh, Stephen. Um, one of the things that we do a lot in, in my particular space is perform um, uh, rule set matching, right? So we deal with compliance within the, within the financial space and compliance as in like regulatory compliance. There's do a set of transactions um, satisfy a given rule and that kind of thing. We use SQL data uh, databases today we're doing um, these kinds of activities, and uh, it's a lot of pattern matching. So it's sort of very straightforward, you know, match a query kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I've looked at uh, like Neo4j for this kind of thing in the past. In the shop that we're in right now, it's all very SQL Server heavy. So that's a, a use case where I, I'd like to, uh, to, you know, it's a potential use case for you. Yeah, yeah, and I think we do talk about rules and like three slides um, or, or we'll go we'll go over it a little bit uh, we can go over a deep 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 dive uh, my goal was to sort of provide a very high level on everything and then uh, you know um, get people exposed and then we'll go deeper into maybe some certain topics um, but yeah rules rules are represented uh, in 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 the query uh, so you can write your dynamic you can write whatever rules or rule sets that you'd want um, 
and um, maybe we can go into maybe uh, questions or concerns deeper into that um, afterwards. Any other any other areas uh, besides fraud? Because I, I I think fraud. Yeah, I think uh, I think Josh just messaged on chat saying fraud is good. It involves community detection, so I think. Uh, my question would be to clarify what that means, community detection, Josh. So he's specifically talking about maybe somebody. Uh, OK. Cool. Seeing the chat, John? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so if you're doing, oh, got some feedback. Yeah, if you're doing community detection, uh, you can run different algorithms to do that or multiple algorithms to do that. You might use a, an output of one algorithm as an input to another algorithm. Um, but yeah, you could do, you could do, I think like uh, community detection. Okay. So you, you might want to do, um, you know, you could maybe do cosine similarity or Levain. Um, you could look at doing different algorithms based off whatever data you have. Um, and I can bring you to the algorithm library and different use cases for that. And we could go deeper into that. Um, after, at, at the very end. So I just want to get through this and we can go deeper. And then maybe I can answer your question better. Okay. Um, so we, we talked a little bit, uh, okay. So we talked a little bit about AI machine learning before. So we can do data enrichment. Um, this is actually being used graphed features. Uh, so it might be a little bit hard to hear, but you are hard to see. Uh, but on the left hand side, you have a good phone. And on the right hand side, you have a bad phone. And so we're actually looking at the um, different different aspects of each of these to determine if they're a good phone or bad phone. So on the right hand side, you can see that, that we're looking at the call duration, we're looking at um, is there is there uh, no you know, nobody calling that person back that has a lot, that phone's been rejected many times. Um, and so this is actually being used by a huge, I think I can say the name China mobile. Um, so if you have ever gotten your phone where you have all these spammers, you know, spamming you, uh, what they're doing is they're doing real time uh, detection of spam. And maybe if you have an iPhone where it pops up and shows you it's spam, they're, they're classifying in real time. So they have all these different features that determine what is a bad phone. And you have all these different features that determines what's a good phone. And so there might be uh, many connections between different phones. So I'm calling my mom, my mom's calling my dad, my dad's calling my brother, my brother's calling my sister. <laughs> and you can see all these different, these different uh, groupings within the connections. You can also see there's a uh, friend, friend hops. You can see there's a stable group of, of calls. It's not just uh, you know this one guy calling random phones all the time. Uh, it's consistency across different devices. So you can do this to classify uh, different things. And why is this important? This is a probably really hard to see. Um, but on the left hand side, you could see that there's a few different numbers that we're looking at for for fraud and machine learning. Sometimes we're looking at like transaction numbers or categories or merchants. Um, so we have a few features, but when we're using uh, graph features, so if you think about taking these good phone, bad phones, and you can do the same thing. Think about it in your domain. Maybe you're in healthcare. Maybe you're in financial situation. You're looking at these patterns or different things that you want to do. You can then use those as additional features, not, not just the patterns themselves, but you could do aggregations of calculations on the fly while you're running your query. And so you're maybe doing calculations of uh, the value of the transactions of the merchants, the number of uh, fraud detected with that merchant. Maybe you're doing the all transactions and the quantity of the number, the amount of, I mean, the amount of the transactions, the total transactions for that merchants. Uh, you're doing all these different, uh, you know, real-time calculations that you might want to use as well um, in, in, in conjunction with your, with your fraud. What that al allows you to actually do is uh, improve your models. And so this was done with financial data um, they have this matrix that's set up. And so just as, just as it's important to detect fraud, you also don't want to have a false positive. Um, you know, if you're going down to Florida and all of a sudden you can't use your credit card and you're sitting there with a $300 bill, <laughs> you don't want to be the guy that's sitting there and trying to call up the bank and be like, why are you doing So it's just as important to catch non-fraud events as it is to catch fraud events and be as accurate as possible. And so by using these additional features, they're able to do um, a 48% uh, better detection of, of, of fraud, and then also remove fa false positives as well, 59%. So I just wanted to show some of that. 
Um, we also get into, uh, this is also into that sort of fraud, anti-money laundering, US, you know, big bank companies. Um, so we talked a little bit about, about deep link analytics. And so we have <clears throat> this user, if you're looking at that pattern, it looks like a bunch of loops coming out of that user. Um, so that user is sending money to one place that's sending money to another place and through another place, another place, another place, another place, and it eventually ends back up to that user. Uh, so they're, they're doing these really complex um, complex transfer of money across multiple different areas and different different systems, but it eventually runs back to them. So they're trying to they're trying to lend, uh, launder money uh, is the, the term. And so I actually pulled out this business case, uh, business use case because I thought maybe it'll be applicable to some people because we talked about financials. Um, so we had a, a bank that wanted to detect uh, these these fraud. Uh, credit card fraud. So they had 10 terabytes of credit card data. Uh, we decided to do a six week POC um, and they were able to deploy the solution within three months after the POC. The solution was using, um, and we're looking at some of these algorithms. So they're using PageRank and Louvain um, to detect that fraud. We're also doing those deep link analytics as well. So, so multi hopping through all the different links. Um, and, and so after the six week POC, uh, 50, 50 million dollars uh, in fraud avoidance was was detected, or was saved. So there's a lot of business opportunity that can be added through using a graph solution, and there's a lot of um, so there's a lot of on uh, on discovered business value, and there's a lot of operational savings that can be done, and that's something we realized when we we're working and building the solutions back in in, in the healthcare space. So what does that look like? Um, we're, again, we're still on fraud. So a fraud uh, solution, you might have these rules. We just talked about rules. Uh, you might have uh, machine learning, statistical models. You might have some you know, different alert systems. You might be using uh, machine learning features as we, we talked about. We might be using some different algorithms. We might be putting a combination of all these different things into alerts. And then we're giving that alert to, to a user. So a user can do a deeper dive, do an analysis. It goes to an investigator to, to determine what, what they should be looking at. And then we're feeding that data back in um, and, 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 and sort of it's the circular process. And as a user, uh, you might, we've been looking at uh, you know, these nodes and these nodes and edges, uh, but that's not exactly, you know, people are always thinking, well, it's, I'm just looking at nodes and edges. Well, no, you're looking at things like this. You're looking at things like, like Google. You're looking at things like LinkedIn. You're looking at things like an analytics dashboard like this. But it's using the power of graph in the back end that's able to, to pull in some of those data elements as well. So hopefully, hopefully you have a better understanding of you know, what are graphs, what are, why are graphs being used, and where they're being used at. And I, I did want to just open it up for questions here. We can do a deeper dive into you know, some performance. And if you wanted to understand the architecture behind Tiger Graph um, and how it's built, if, if you want to look at some white papers of use cases. So if you're in the supply chain world and you want to see how other companies are using uh, Tiger Graph for supply chain, or if you're in the finance world or AML or you know, entity resolution, you can, or healthcare, you can go deep into each of these. And it's really nice because it provides you sort of a reference of how others are using graphs to be able to, to solve real problems. Um, if you're wanting to look at benchmarks, we can go on there. And then we can finally, if you want to sort of get your hands on and, and play with a graph, uh, we can go there as well. But I just wanted to open it up for questions. Real quick, uh, first you answered my question on, uh on community detection as part of the uh, uh, money laundering deal. Uh, that's impressive. If you manage to uh, uh, run Louvain community detection against 10 terabytes of data, I am thoroughly impressed. I just want to uh, ask uh, how much infrastructure did you need for that? Um, 10 terabytes of data. Probably a lot of servers uh, running in parallel. Uh, <laughs> I don't know the exact number. I wasn't on that that business use case. Uh, I could probably get you to the person that implemented that POC, the solution architect, and they could probably give you the exact. Okay, it was this Dell server. I was using this many, uh, you know, this this <laughs> many this many pieces of RAM and using uh, HPG nine and 
and whatnot. But uh, I'm assuming that they had a pretty big beefy uh, solution. So when I was in healthcare and we had our healthcare graph was 5 billion, no, 8 billion nodes in, in eight to eight to 10. I can't remember when I left, I think it's now 10 billion, but 50, 50 billion connections between these different elements. And we're running on really beefy 256 gigs of memory per box um, stacked, you know, across, you know, you know, five, seven, 10 boxes, depending on, um, you know, the size of our graph at the time. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you just, the more data you're going to have the, the, you know, we can't, you can't, you can't just keep putting it in the same box. Uh, and a lot of the other solutions that came out um, before Tiger Graph, uh, they were built to scale, scale horizontally. Uh, so when Optum, when you know, we're looking at a graph solution, well, we're like, well, we're gonna have so much, we need like petabytes. We're, we, <laughs> we have so much data, we need to be able to scale horizontally. And so, um, you know, Tiger Graph was architected from the ground up to scale horizontally. Uh, and that's, you know, that's why we, we went with Tiger Graph at the time. But so, yeah, that, to answer your question, you, you need a lot of beefy boxes for 10 terabytes. Um, you know, there is compression. The compression, I don't know the exact, so don't quote me on the compression, but the compression between the, the data. So if you have 10 terabytes, I can't remember if it was a 60% compression. It was. Yeah, it's, it's it pretty. Oh, hey, Michael. Yeah, sorry, I, I missed the first part. Um, and and uh, Mohammed and, and team, I, thanks for uh, setting this up. The, the the answer on the um, ten terabyte Louvain um, benchmark was that they had about ten terabytes of RAM in their cluster with some overhead above that. So you know what, forty beefy servers in John's uh, topology, uh, standard networking, no no exotic uh, InfiniBand. Um, I think it was ten GB, maybe one GB, um, and. Uh, they were able to run Louvain without sampling, which is what we in the in the um, Louvain business call cheating. So it was it was across the full data set, iteratively queries took minutes, not hours. That's hella impressive. Uh, That's hella impressive, and and and, and, sure. and we we had some really really smart people on the customer side helping us kind of get the answer right, and, and we're really excited about that. So we would love to tell you who who, who it is and why, but. You can imagine they don't want us to, to know or share that information, so. Yeah, just one uh, quick follow-on question to that. So I know last year at some point you started working with Xilinx to, um, to, to prototype certain things and maybe even have a partnership with them, but were you looking at, uh, I don't know, maybe putting some of these capabilities into hardware and sort of having uh, you know, search related, custom search related chips developed with them on an FPGA board. Just wondering what the uh, what the rationale for that was and, and, and if you're trying to, is it performance related? I'm sure it is performance related to some degree, but what is, is that something you can talk about? John, is do you want me to take that or you, do you know the answer? No, no, go ahead, yeah. Okay, so so, here, so here's here's kind of our story with Xilinx and, and you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the unvarnished version. Um, so, so a couple of thoughts, so first of all, FPGAs can do things um, in, in parallel in ways that CPUs can't, that's obvious. But what's interesting is that we actually are, are able to run C++ um, user-defined functions on the Xilinx Alveo card. And that includes things like cosine similarity, Louvain, and we're working on other algorithms. And, and so with uh, cosine similarity, we're 40X faster than, a, than an Intel Xeon, a high-end Intel Xeon. Um, when it comes to Louvain, it's 20x faster. So, so we have significant performance uh, acceleration. We have not yet gone down the path of kind of custom, asking Xilinx to customize their hardware to us. Um, the mouse can ask the elephant to dance, but you know you, you really got to be smart about that. Um, what, what is impressive and encouraging is the performance de deltas that we get from UDFs out of Xilinx. And so we're able to do things in real time that we couldn't do you know, except, you know, much slower. The challenge is that we still don't have kind of the full Tiger Graph uh, SDK for Xilinx. And so we, we still have work to do on that front, but we're working on it. And, and so, so they are now able to scale out with lots of cards across a single server and lots of servers across a, a, a fleet. And, and so the summary is that we're, we're leveraging existing capabilities within um, Xilinx 
And we have more work to do to make it easier for um, our partners and our customers to actually be able to implement those UDFs you know, on their own without being an expert in, in the, the world of Xilinx. So uh, great progress so far, a lot more work to do, and we can't wait to share more information, especially now that you know, Xilinx is part of the AMD family. And you looked at, the, there was an AWS offering that allows you to do sort of customized FPGA boards on yep. AWS. Have you looked at that at all? Well, every every algorithm that runs on an FPGA, if FPGA board is is by its nature customized, right? It's own it's its own kernel, so to speak, and that's the that's the compilation and the development, um, and and then you know rewrite and compilation, et cetera. That the whole development cycle is unique to um, kind of what we can do with Xilinx. And yes, we are, and and, and Xilinx has instances in AWS and uh, Azure and and uh, GCP. Um, so they're not just an, an on-premise solution, but a lot of the customers who we're talking to in financial services, in some case, cases, healthcare, those are on-prem customers. And so you can expect us to do more and more with Xilinx in the, in the cloud. And, and good idea, glad you thought of it. <laughs> yeah, I, there, there's a question that someone had in the audience, I think uh, Gaurav, he was asking about reasoners and property graphs, and if so, how do you achieve inference um, in Tiger Graph? I don't know if you saw that, John. Yeah, I was just trying to hold Clubhouse next to my my ear. Um, so the question was uh, about how do you how do you determine um, influencers or influencers? I'm sorry, sorry. And <laughs> influencers, inference, inference, influencers, In influencers. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, there's no uh, magical wand of auto detecting all. Uh, uh, um, I would say uh, inferences. Um, there's, uh, you could, you could set up a construct of, of, of patterns and rules of determining what is, uh, you know, just let's say for an example, we have a person and we have a relationship to that person and the relationship's father. Um, so we have a, you know, John, his father is Larry and his father is Larry. Well, there's no connection between John and, and my grandpa, but we can, based off this pattern, we can determine that, you know, my grandpa's, uh, my father's father. Right. And so we can write that relationship to it, um, uh, by, by looking at that, that pattern. Now there's no, um, that I'm aware of that can uh, just look at your data and then automatically determine, um, determine, you know, inferencing, uh, there's no magical wand to it, uh, but um, you can do things uh, like the patterns or algorithms to to, to best guess or to be able to determine those inferencing uh, connections. I don't know, Michael, if you have anything else that you well, want to add. I, I, all I would say is that um, G-SQL, Graph Structure Query Language, is Turing complete. So you can do inferencing inside G-SQL with the right algorithm written. And I don't, I don't know that anybody has done that yet. Um, to John's point, you know, yes, you can you can um, apply NC resolution and um, you know resolu and, and and relationship matching to find common um, edges as well as common patterns between vertices. That doesn't rise to the same level as kind of what RDF systems can do for co cognitive systems and and inferencing. But um, I want to go do do some more digging on on that loaded question because it's a good one. Hey, th thanks, Gaurav, for the question. Thanks, John and Michael, for, for response uh, to sure. that. Gaurav, is there any, any follow-up that you have to that or any further questions on that? Front? I think you're on mute, Gaurav, so you'll have to unmute if uh, you want to ask. All right. Any, any other questions, anyone else? Um, anything that, uh, um, I think Stephen, you you mentioned something early on. I don't know if that was answered or not, but if you if you have any follow-ups to that or. Uh... No, I guess I just have one, one, one quick uh, comment, which is a challenge that I've had in the past relative to uh, implementing um, or adopting graph data is in the context of, you know, existing teams that know SQL really well, but uh, and and, and SQL-like variants like PL SQL or T SQL, but you know every time that we touch a graph database, it seems like the providers providing their own uh, language, right? Like G SQL in the case of Tiger Graph or uh, um, Cipher in the case of Neo4j, although they have a SQL variant as well. 
Um, and I think one of the challenges that, that, that we've run into, and I'd love to you guys talk about this since you guys are coming from the other side is, you know, adoption uh, in an organization is difficult because of the, um, the sort of skill set match is really that it requires, you know, um, a different way of thinking in a way, but in many cases, you know, SQL works just fine. What variations of it mean, uh, you know, how to learn effectively, kind of like a DSL for interacting with graphs. So if you guys can speak to that, that'd be great. John, Mike, would you like to take that or would you like me? Uh, either one, either one. I, I'll let you go. I'm, I'm holding my phone up to a clubhouse trying to present there too. Okay, so so here's, here's a quick summary. It's a great question. Uh, you know, every time you have Kind of a new technology or a new approach. Everyone has to add, you know, DSL on steroids, and it's it's it's. I I, I feel your pain. Um, here here's here's the 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 kind of there's a two part answer. One is select star where works in G SQL, but you get so much more. You get you get accumulators. You can do an analytics on that. That means intermediate values, and so we can do complex algebra on the fly as we traverse the graph. G SQL is a Turing complete language. That means you know queries can create queries, queries can be recursive, um, and we can actually, you know, we, we're working on a, a relational database migration tool that will bring in your schema, bring in the data set, and then also take a first pass at converting your SQL query to to G SQL. Now, you can imagine that that's going to be more of a science experiment initially, but over time we expect that to become full, a full-fledged proper enterprise tool. That doesn't answer your question though. That, 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 that only says G SQL is, is, you know, can leverage um, kind of what you're already doing um, from a, um, you know, you, you, you can extend your SQL knowledge to G SQL and, and we have, you know, training classes, we have online stuff, but you know, that that's, that's saying that we're close, but not quite. Where where this really wants to go over time is that um, the, you know the ISO has a has a um, a working group that's working on something called GQL, Graph Query Language, which is kind of the graph direct analog to SQL ninety nine, SQL, et cetera. So all of the all the SQL standards, and you pointed out, you know, there's lots of variations on that as well. We're, we're we, you know, our, our head engineer and several of our product uh, management team are on the G SQL a G, GQL um, you know uh, working group, and we're, we've had initial releases of GQL as an emerging standard. We we fully expect that to get for, fully formalized later this year or next year. GQL will be the you know the the rallying point for the industry to say, okay, here is kind of a baseline standard for um, a query language that speaks to graph. Again, more work in progress, but the summary is we're getting there. Um, uh, and and we, we think that, um, you know, kind of G, G SQL will, will, will be basically a superset of GQL. You know, GQL will not have accumulators. Um, G, uh, G, GQL will not have other things. G SQL is, is a great language. But what's really powerful about it is the fact that you could write algorithms that are, you know, very, very um, succinct. Um, it's a rich program environment, and it, and and we can get a lot of work done at a very powerful level um, in ways with the G SQL. We think, of course, we think it's special. It's you know, it's our baby. But you know, kind of turning that into an industry standard means that we're going to be able to work interoperate, and by the way, you know, make it easier for everybody to learn how to speak directly to graph databases and do interesting thing, things from that point of view. So, you know, the evolution of technology always involves nonlinear learning curves. And, and this, this may be one of those again, but, but I think that the, the benefit here is being able to run algorithms inside a graph database with all the benefits of accumulators and all the rest is gonna be very powerful. And we're, we're trying to bring the industry along with us on this one. So, you know, members of the GQL working committee include Oracle, IBM, um, Neo4j, us, and others. And you, you can expect us to kind of um, continue to move the uh, state of the art forward from that perspective. So does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. Cool. I have a question on the similar lines. Um, 
So we do have obviously a lot of uh, relational databases, right? So, and uh, I'm all, we're also pretty interested in looking at uh, the graph databases, trying to move the systems over there, uh, specifically because, you know, we are into payments, this is what we do, and uh, fraud analytics, and uh, the other things that we touched upon a few minutes ago, uh, this looks pretty interesting, actually. I'm going to look more deep into it. But uh, the question that I have is that, uh, you know, I know migration will be a painful thing, but uh, I'm just wondering that uh, can we have this data existing in two different types of databases, you know? One, the existing database with the relational format, and the other part of it where I really want to do fraud analytics and uh, some detailed forensics regarding that, can I have that in graphical uh, graph databases? Is that possible? Is that an architecture that's possible or do we still have to wait for GQL or GSQL adoption in full form? Yeah, so I, I was just having the, the phone up to my ear and it looks like Michael jumped. So your question is, does everything go in the graph? No. Um, it's not a replacement. It is an enhancement to your solution. You don't, um, you know, let's say, uh, you have a document, a full document, with a bunch of rich text. Uh, you would pair up with maybe a document store, MongoDB, and then you're syncing MongoDB. That's going to be all your document store. Um, and let's say, uh, let's say we have uh, a bunch of meta about that. And so we have meta from different systems or maybe other elements that are coming into, into your solution. So when, when was the doc, create, doc created? When was it last edited? When it was, or who it was sent to? All the different elements to it. Um, you, would, you would store all of the highly interrelated uh, um, um, data inside of your, your graph solution. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, Hey, here's tiger graph and here's going to replace everything that you have. And it's going to be the, the source of truth. And when we're using it at United health group, we would have source systems and we would, we would pump data into, um, into, into tiger graph and it, the data would still go into other solutions. So if you think of like a, a hose, a hose coming out of your house and you have a little splitter and the, the water's coming out one end and the other end, um, we would we would be pushing some of that that flow towards Tiger Graph. And especially if it's highly interrelated, interconnected, of course, we didn't want to put like everything. We don't want to store the nurse, all the text of the nurse's notes inside of inside of Tiger Graph. Maybe they're in a document store, but we'd store maybe where that that reside inside of Tiger Graph. And so when we're searching that element, we, we know exactly where it's located and then we can extract it and pull it exactly from where it's at. Um, so I guess the, the answer to your question is, is it a full, do you, do you, do you just pump everything into Tiger Graph and replace your systems? No, you, you, you identify where there's complexities and where there's a lot of interconnected data and where you need this data accessible at real time and what data you need. Um, and you store those elements inside of the graph solution. You don't, you don't just, um, no, of course there's like, you know, I guess some people have <laughs> used, a uh, try to replace it. Uh, I don't know exactly if there's a single customer that just replaced everything and just had just tight graph. Um, so it's very complementary with other other systems. I wouldn't I wouldn't say, hey, let's take out the data swamp and 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 put in Tiger Graph. Maybe you maybe you want maybe you'd want to do that instead of trying to join those those nasty databases together. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, and, and and Minnesota here, I we have a joke because our our slogan for Minnesota is uh, the, the the land of ten thousand lakes, and and we always joke about it, the land of ten thousand data lakes, because you're just sitting here trying to pull everything. Uh, together. Um, but anyways, yeah. So short answer, no, you don't replace everything. Um, and, and you, you, you try to identify those certain elements that are, are needed to be able to represent your data inside of, uh, the graph solution. So. My question, um, you know, my, with my limited knowledge of graph databases, my understanding is that you build this graph nodes while the data is in motion, right? Well, the data is pumped into the first time, start linking the information, start building the data and all the linkage as the data comes in. Um, so from that perspective, uh, should, should the graph databases be built going forward from now onwards or can I use my ex existing data as well to migrate some part of the data into a graphical linkages and whatnot and utilize the historical information as well? 
Yeah. So, t um, so you, you, you're, you're saying that you've, uh, pumped data into a graph and it auto populated, um, tiger graph is, is, uh, schema first. You have to have a schema. You have to define how you're going to have data, uh, streaming into your, your solution. So you can't just, Hey, I'm going to hook up data and just pops in there and it's just everywhere. You know, um, you have to define your schema. Um, and there might be a graph that has a, a subgraph, so you can actually have multi graphs inside of tiger graph. So that's important when you want to do uh, this data as should be accessed by that data, but there's a, a certain node, maybe a person that's ac accessible by multiple databases, but all of that is defined in a schema first. And so you have your schema, which are your nodes and your, your edges and those nodes and edges have attributes. And when you're pumping your data in, you have uh, you have a like a, a translator. You have to you have to know where your data goes into into the graph. And so you have uh, you could have loading jobs for uh, maybe you're po 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 pulling uh, data from Kafka. Um, and so that when that data comes in, it's it's going to be uh, put into where it's uh, connected to. And so that you're going to start to see your graph populate uh, based off how you defined your schema, and your data is going to flow into into your graph defined by that schema. And we could, I could show you a very, like a simplistic way of viewing that if we wanna, if we wanna go into sort of like, hey, let's set up our first free graph. I mean, you just go onto this platform and it, you can pop up, you know, in a few minutes you have your own graph solution and we can walk through that. Um, but but yeah, that's that's essentially, so there, you, you, data wouldn't just stream in and be everywhere, you have to, you have to have it. You have to have it model. But let's say you have another node, right? And you want to connect that node into your your graph. Maybe it's a new data element from a new pipeline that has more connections to existing data. That's fine. You don't have to like tear down your whole graph solution, uh, put in that new vertices, and then bring your whole graph solution up. You just essentially um, append that. You'd make a schema change. You append that new uh, vertice and maybe the new edges, and you start to pump that data into into that. And so it, it adds that uh, additional flexibility um, that you can do in real time. So your data is actually still, you know, working and, and you're adding that new element without tearing things down. Thank you. Yeah. Is there any, do you guys want to, you know, demo? I, let me get, let me... can you also check with uh, on Clubhouse to see if anyone's got questions there? Just um, they can raise their hands and I can bring them in. Yeah, I was, I was trying to keep the clubhouse uh, next to my earphone so they can hear you as well. Um, but if you're on clubhouse, you have questions, raise your hand um, and we can try to answer them as well. Am I still sharing the screen? So we have, you could do this thing called test drive. Um, some people were asking about if you wanna you know, do supply chain or um, let's see what this one, enterprise graph. It's a healthcare graph, anti-fraud. So these ones, what you could just do is click on play and it's got like a solution you can play around with. So this, you don't even log in or anything. You're essentially just going onto our website and they have this thing called, let's see if I can. I'll show you how to get it in case you want to, to follow along. So you go to tigerraft.com, you say get started for free. Uh, I think it's try online demo. Yeah, it brings you to like all these. So these are real, like not really, like, they're really running live. Um, and so you can just pop in and, and start to play with them. And so you have this, this nice graphical user interface that's on top of uh, the database. Let's look at this one specifically. It's an anti-fraud use case. Uh, let's see how it's modeled. Okay, it's pretty simple. They got a user. The user has some, you know, vertice or some elements around it. It's got a connection back to a user. The user has a transaction. Uh, looks like there's some kind of, you know, payment instrument. Um, I suppose that's maybe a credit card uh, and a device that they're using. So this is a schema. Someone defined the schema. They created the schema with the, these different elements. Um, I'm just seeing if they have any data on the edge here. This user right. transaction. A API or is it data element? The user, the user what? User transaction or user received transaction. Rather. Oh, this one, this one's an edge. So a, a user received transactions. Let's let's actually look at some of the data. What it looked like. <laughs> so this is really a simplified version because it's just taking CSV files. So you said 
you said uh, this one. So there's like a transactions. And so we have a user, user ID, a client and a request. And so they're, they're essentially mapping, okay, from, from this to that, from this to that. Uh, if we click on here, it's loading in some more data. It looks like this was a timestamp. Um, they're they're connecting this relationship from this edge to this edge. So all of this this is sort of like the GUI version of a, ski, uh, a a loading job because it's just saying, okay, here's the here's the uh, CSV on the left hand side, and this is how it's inserted into the graph on the right hand side. Um, so if you wanted to use your, I'll, I'll show you how to set up your own if you want to do it for free. It's it's pretty easy and you have this full interface, but all these buttons are grayed out. So I could show you how to upload a file or you know make these connections and stuff, but it's grayed out for this test drive. Um, so then you have the data in here. Okay, so this this has a lot of, you know, it's got four, four, four million. Is that four million or, yeah, four million at <laughs> edges. And uh, I need to get glasses, by the way. They're, they're coming in 10 days. <laughs> four, four billion. Oh, is it four billion? Okay. And then, um, so let's say we want to do some exploring graphs. So that's nice. Now we have our schema defined. We, we, we put some data in there. We all loaded that data up. Uh, let's just choose some random things. Um, so I just chose five of everything. We'll just do a sample. Let's say I want to connect on this person. I want to start to see, okay, um, you know, here's how this person's connected to certain data. This isn't really helpful for me because it's just like clicking on things and seeing how things are connected. Um, where it might be helpful is thinking about how you might want to write your query. Uh, you might want to sort of explore certain areas, be like, okay, I want to find all of these that are connected to this, connected to that. How would I write that query? And that's where you can get into your query writing. Um, let's just run this one. I think this is the one I showed you. So we just choose the user one. So this is doing uh, circle detection. So somebody wrote this query. Um, some of those accumulators that uh, that Michael was mentioning, accumulators do like certain functionality and can be um, executed uh, during when you're doing your query. So what that means is you're travert, like in this case, you've got select from, and then you're using accumulators. So it's doing us. It's going to use these. Uh, conditions, here's a case condition, when this equals that, then we're going to do at, at, min, source, send time. So this is taking, if we go to min, source, send time, min, source, send time, min, source, send time. Okay, so this is a mini, min, min accumulator. So it's gonna go through and accumulate and try to find the minimum, uh, you know, I guess, source, send time. And so it's doing certain functions when you're traversing. So every time, you're starting from somewhere. In this case, you're starting from the source ID. It's going across and it's finding whatever the, the smallest time and, and adding it from the timestamp. And so, um, yeah, I, I came from, I didn't, you know, I when I got started with Pegagraph, I, <laughs> I didn't, of course, know the graph query language either, uh, but I knew SQL. And so if you know SQL and you know how to do basic programming with if, else, when, um, it's it's actually not too 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 bad. Um, so I didn't write this query, so I don't know exactly every single step that they're doing to determine this. Um, but somebody spent some some time building this query out to to determine what what uh, you know what what these uh, circle detections patterns look like. Yeah. But anyways, this is pretty complex query. Yeah, yeah I, this this one will take you to three hundred. 300 lines. Uh, <laughs> this one would take you quite a while to 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 write from scratch. Uh, this is probably not their, the best query for for a first time user to to come to. Um, but uh, one way you could you could get started. Uh, you can provision your own box, and they're on AWS. You get it for free. Uh, there's no cost. Uh, you literally go to tgcloud.io, and if you don't have an account, you can sign up. If you do, like me, you can sign back in. Um, so basically, those queries are nothing but uh, some kind of rules that you're writing, and you can define those. You can maybe give names to those queries as well, right? Yeah, yeah, and you could you could have you could have a set of rules, or you could do a certain pattern, and you could have you could even write that as a function and call it from another query, um, and you could have these really complex queries that call other queries that call other queries. So you could have a query that's like a method or a function, um, 
and that might be doing doing some of those patterns yeah and you might be accumulating certain things that so you could do like a let's say you wanted to use list accum and you want to list you a list of all of the elements that meet a certain condition so you might want to use a list accum and accumulate those um, into a list um, but yeah so you have tgcloud.io you have this dashboard uh, you go to my solutions and i think it's like four clicks you can just literally go through um, I clicked on this thing that called create a solution and you just choose if you want a blank kit with nothing in it, you could do that. I wrote a kit on COVID analysis. So I took the Korean center of disease control data and they had like some time series data around, uh, where a person was at, I don't know if they're taking it from their cell phone or something, but it was very interesting because they identified this patient infected that patient. And so I was like, okay, so if they have time series data, what if I, put a timestamp on that and look for people that um, were at the same place at the same time, but weren't told they were actually infected by that patient. Can we make, can we an, analyze that um, and see if there's any of those cases? And there's tons of them. <laughs> this person was with the same person like five times in five different days at the same time in the same location. So it was pretty interesting, but yeah, if you want to dive deeper into like, you know, 360 or fraud and stuff like that, you just literally click on this, click next and you click next on getting a free one, you give it a name, um, you get a, a custom subdomain. I usually just put Tiger Graph as a password. Um, if you click next, it'll just say, so everything look good and it'll, it'll launch it. And so when it launches, you'll you'll have a box like this um, that you can, you can mine's, mine's sort of stopped right now, but yours would be ready to go. And you just click here and you would, you click actually this application. When your box is ready, you can click this application. It brings you to something that looks like this. And of course you can like, you know, use all your other tools to interact with it and stuff like that. But that's like the crash course on, on getting a box set up. Thank you. Yeah. Um, if you have questions like throughout your journey, you can, you can come join me. I'm always in the community uh, asking and answering you know, questions to users. So if you, you do decide to, you know, jump on, you could, you could come. You, you, you guys, yeah. You guys also, you, you guys also have a discord server, right? That, uh, is that, is that, is that a discord server or, cause I know during COVID you had one, I'm not sure if you still have that discord server open. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. So, um, I'm muted on Clubhouse because I don't want Echo, um, but we do have a Discord server. So a lot of development, here's somebody talking right now. Uh, so we have a support channel where developers are actually talking to developers in real time. Um, so it's nice to just be able to reach out to, to people or if you're, uh, you know, want to show something off, you can do that. Or there's articles and blogs and different resources. Um, yeah, so there's quite a few people here in the community that just chat and ask each other questions or help each other out. I would say like the community site, community.tigerapp.com is a lot easier if you have like a, a specific question that you can have a long form discussion on. But if you want to get to the Discord link, you just click the chat button and it'll bring you to Discord. All right, cool. Yeah, so I think, uh, I'm not sure if there are any other questions. We've run, run quite a bit over if, uh, if there are the, um, those on, on Clubhouse, you can ping me on Clubhouse for anyone on Zoom. Um, you know, I think you have my email as well as you're connected to me on LinkedIn. Just send, drop a drop a quick note to me or to John, um, and we can get you in touch with uh, with, with with anyone that uh, can help answer any questions that uh, that you might have. Uh, um, also, John, it makes sense. That, so one of the things we've done for some of for our previous mastermind series is we put together like a um, a blog post as well as a a, uh, a video breakdown of the session and uh, and shared it. Um, in this particular case, we'll we'll have to think about it. I'm not sure if a blog post makes sense here as much as uh, having uh, having the video recording distributed and uh, and available. But the other thing that could be useful is having access to uh, uh, to that Discord so easily, so people can ask questions there as well. Um, I'm not sure, Satish, if there's any other thing that you wanted John to cover or had any thoughts, but uh, uh, from my perspective, uh, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of ground that was covered already. And uh, I think uh, you know, we, we, uh, we, we need to figure out how we can 
how we can get the uh, follow up on this going if there's any. Yeah, my primary job is just helping developers out. That's all I do every day. So um, I'm open to any questions and helping anybody out. The other way that you might want to, you know, if you want to start to get um, familiar with TigerGraph, this is a cool way to, to win money. I think we have like $15,000 worth of prizes. It's free to enter. Um, and this specific one is a, a dashboard visualization one. And so you're, you're spinning up a TigerGraph cloud box and this walks you through it. Um, using PyTigerGraph and doing Streamlit. Um, so it just allows you to be able to, uh, you know, have a fun interactive way to, to learn about the technology. And you could compete for a prize if you want to. I just wanted to share this with you. So when team. does that, is that constantly running or does it stop? We're, uh, we're, we're having a hackathon every, every month. Um, so this is the one for February, March. You can sign up now, um, but the submission's open through February 22nd through uh, March. And it's like, it's like the prize money is what for the winner or just in general? Uh, so we have first place, second place, third place. We have sort of these categories like best graphistry or best streamlet, most popular, if more people vote for yours, um, best documented. So you get money if you document well, uh, best UI and everybody who submits something, the first 50 get a $50 uh, card, give credit credits to the cloud. Cool. I think, uh, yes, Satish, so we can share this with the wider community as well uh, on the developer side of our communities. Yeah, yes. it'd be a great way for your community to, to learn. Yeah, while we're sharing, uh, you know, breaking this talk into micro content, we'll be sure to tag you, uh, John. We plan to share this in multiple channels so people can interact with you and ask questions, and uh, we'll share this information as well. Perfect. I can add you guys to a community partner if you want. If you guys want to partner up with that. Sure. Yeah, let's let's talk through it offline. But any any other questions either on Clubhouse or on Zoom before uh, before we, we call it a wrap? Um, if you don't have any questions now, no worries. You can message me on uh, on you know Twitter or LinkedIn, and we can get those questions answered as well. Thank you, Mohammed, for setting up this. Uh... Uh, this, this, this session is very informative. Thanks, Amber. Good seeing you after a long time. I think ten years now, and look look pretty much the same though. Yeah. Different background. <laughs> yeah, background. All right. Um, any any? It doesn't look like there's anyone uh, any raised hands on Clubhouse. I, I, and unless there's anything else on Zoom, we're going to end the session now. Cool. Well, thank you for having me. Oh, thank you. Thanks a lot, John. This is great. All right. See you guys. Thanks a lot, John. See you.